Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last three lectures of EC 3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at the three basic single transistor amplifier types involving BJTs, namely the common emitter, common collector, and common base configurations. We analyzed these amplifiers using a set of Norton and Thevenin equivalent circuits developed by my colleague Marshall Leach. Here, we're going to start looking at more complicated amplifier structures that involve multiple transistors, and we'll begin by combining a couple of common emitter amplifiers. So here I have one common emitter amplifier, and here I have another common emitter amplifier. So we're including an RS, that's a resistance that's representing the output impedance of whatever source is driving our amplifier cascade. This resistance is not considered part of the amplifier itself. And we also have an external load that the amplifier cascade is driving, and this RL is also not considered part of the amplifier itself. Now, notice that the output of the first amplifier is directly coupled to the input of the second amplifier. This complicates our biasing considerations. We could make the biasing easier by AC coupling or capacitively coupling. So I could put a capacitor here, and then I could put a couple of resistors here going to our power supplies of V plus and V minus. And then this would make the biasing calculations pretty easy because I have two independent amplifiers I need to think about the biasing for. Now, for the small signal analysis, that is more complicated because one amplifier is loading down the other, but this would make the biasing easier. But that's not what we're doing here. We're taking the output of the first amplifier and jamming it directly into the input of the next amplifier. So these amplifiers are going to interact in terms of how the biasing works. Now, in the last couple of lectures over here, I've had an expansion of the schematic that shows our DC bias and our small signal circuit. That actually winds up being too much material for one slide. So I'll first talk about the DC biasing and then we'll talk about the small signal analysis. So the DC biasing here is more complicated. In the previous three slides, we had the same biasing configuration, and it basically was the stuff over here with R1, R2, and RC1 and RE3. But now we have all this complicated stuff associated with Q2 and the resistors hanging off of it. So I'm going to have to find IC1 and IC2, and that's going to be a little bit more complicated than the sort of things we've done before. All right, so let's go ahead and write our bias equation for Q1, and then we'll write a bias equation for Q2, and then we'll see how these equations interact. Now, this isn't going to be as complicated as the example I'm going to do a couple of lectures from now, but it's still going to be a little bit complicated. So... Fortunately, our bias equation for Q1 is basically what we had previously. This part isn't that much more difficult. Actually, it's not any more difficult. So for Q1, we'll compute a Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out of the base, and the Thevenin equivalent voltage we'll call VBB1, and that's just something we can get from V plus and V minus with voltage division rules. Remember when we compute a Thevenin equivalent, we break the connection that we're looking out of the terminal of, so no current is flowing there. All right, so we also need to compute the Thevenin resistance looking out, and for computing the Thevenin resistance looking out, we zero out our independent voltage sources, and so we just see this parallel combination of R1 with R2. All right, so we're also going to need a Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out of the emitter, and that's easy. The Thevenin equivalent voltage will just be our V minus power supply, and our Thevenin equivalent resistance is just RE1. All right, so in a previous lecture, we showed that the resulting bias current, IC1, as far as the collector goes, is given by this expression here. And that's enough as far as biasing Q1 goes. Now, if you want to make sure that Q1 is operating in the active region, it's very useful to have the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the collector. 
Now, that is going to be a little bit more complicated. So from the point of view of looking out of the collector, I really have two sources. I have V plus up here, as we've had before, but I also have this bias current going into the base. So I can think about these as independent voltage sources when computing the Thevenin equivalent, and I can incorporate their effects using superposition. So what do I have going on here? Computing the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the collector, I can zero out the IB2 source. So I open that up, and my only source then is V+. Plus, and we cut the connection here when computing the Thevenin equivalent. So no current is flowing, so no voltage is being lost. So the V plus source just contributes a V plus to our Thevenin equivalent voltage. Now, when looking out of the collector and then zeroing out our V plus source to focus on IB2, well, now we imagine that there's an IB2 that's being pulled out of this node and I can figure out its effect on the voltage by Ohm's law. So I have IB2 times RC1, and we can tell that we want a minus sign here because we're pulling current out of the node. Okay, now to compute the Thevenin equivalent resistance looking out of the collector, I zero out the sources. So I open up the current source, and I essentially ground the voltage source, so I just see a resistance RC1. Now to figure out IB2, once you figure out what IC1 is, you can just divide by beta1 to get IB2. So that's useful if you want to check to make sure that Q1 is acting in the active region. Analyzing Q2 is more complicated. So if we want a Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out of the base, remember that we temporarily snip the wire here so no current's flowing. So I have two sources that can contribute to the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base. I have V plus, but I also have this current IC1 flowing into Q1 that I can treat as an independent current source while computing this Thevenin equivalent. So looking out of the base here, I have two sources and I can deal with them by superposition. When I zero out IC1 so I can focus on V plus, well, no current is flowing here, so I wind up with a voltage of just V plus since no voltage is being lost. Alternatively, when I look out here and I focus on this current source, I zero out the voltage source, and then I can figure out the effect of this current source on the voltage by Ohm's law. That's just IC1 times RC1. And again, I know that there's a minus sign here because this arrow here indicates that we're pulling current out of the node. So this tells us that our computation of IC2 is going to depend on what we computed for IC1. Okay, so the Thevenin equivalent resistance looking out of the base is just RC1, because when we zero out our sources here to compute that resistance, this has no current flowing through it, so you just see RC1. All right, what about our Thevenin equivalent looking out the emitter? Well, that's easy. I just have a Thevenin voltage of my power supply V minus, and I have a Thevenin equivalent resistance of my emitter resistor RE2. In a previous lecture, we discovered this generic BJT bias equation, and on the next slide, I'll solve that for IC2. Now, if you want to double check to make sure that Q2 is operating in the active mode, it's helpful to have the Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out of the collector. So that's pretty easy. We just have a Thevenin equivalent voltage of the power supply and a Thevenin equivalent resistance of this collector resistor RC2. No biggie. So let's try to find IC2 explicitly. I'll take VBB2 and plug it in here, and then we'll take RBB2 equal RC1 and plug that in here. And then we'll take RE2 and plug that in here. All right, so making those substitutions, we wind up with an equation that looks like this. And if I solve this for IC2, we get this big mess here. But it's really not that tricky because you can find IC1 without needing to know IC2 
and then plug IC1 into here to find IC2. And the example we'll look at a couple of lectures from now, these equations are actually coupled. So you actually have to solve a two by two set of equations and it's a pain. So once you have IC1 and IC2, you can plug those into our usual formulas to compute the small signal parameters. And here I've added some ones to indicate the parameters associated with Q1. And we also have a new set of parameters associated with Q2. So we have our raw input and output resistances, the raw emitter resistance, and the raw transconductance for both transistors. Okay, so to compute the small signal circuit, we'll essentially assume that all of the capacitors operate as short circuits. Later in this class, I'll show you techniques for dealing with the capacitors in more detail that will allow us to look at their effect on the frequency response of the amplifier. For right now, let's just suppose that they're shorts for small signals. All right, the other thing that I'm doing here is I'm going to replace whatever resistances we see looking out of the emitters as some Thevenin equivalent resistances. Here that's RTE1 and RTE2. And for the particular resistor capacitor configuration shown here, these consist of some resistances in parallel. You can readily adapt this analysis to some other configuration. Okay, so let's compute the small signal voltage gain of this cascade. I think most textbooks would probably approach this by breaking this up into two separate amplifier sections and considering the output impedance of the first section and the input impedance of the next section and then interfacing the sections through that by calculating the actual voltage at the base. But if we really embrace Marshall Leach's way of using equivalent circuits, we can deal with things in terms of Thevenin equivalent voltages and kind of work our way from the output back to the input, just kind of writing down pieces of the answer as we move along. At this point, I recommend going to Marshall's EC3050 website. Remember, 3050 is an earlier version of 3400. And we have this BJT formula summary sheet with these Thevenin equivalent circuits and Norton equivalent circuits and the associated formulas for these circuits. And I recommend printing this out and having it handy when watching this lecture and the remaining BJT focus lectures. You should make big copies of it and put them on poster board and hang them on your wall. You should become highly acquainted with this formula sheet. Now, in the previous three lectures, I often took the BJT and rewrote the symbol using one of these equivalent circuits where I would replace the symbol with the appropriate equivalent circuit and I would draw out the circuit explicitly. From this point forward, I'm just going to sort of use these circuits without drawing them out explicitly. So you'll have to learn to look at the BJT symbol, know that when we're looking into the collector, we're using this circuit, looking into the base, we're using this circuit, and when we're looking into the emitter, we're using this circuit. And there's two versions shown here, but they're equivalent under the R0 approximation. So instead of writing a series of equations and piling them together as I did in previous lectures, here I'm just going to go directly to the Mason flow graph. Okay, so what is the output voltage? Well, if we know the short circuit current for the Norton equivalent circuit looking into the collector, then I can compute the voltage with Ohm's law by multiplying by a parallel combination of RC2, RL, and RIC2, which is the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector. And I know that there's a minus sign here since this is pulling current out of the node. All right, so what is the short circuit current IC2? Well, that is just the Thevenin equivalent voltage seen looking out of the base times R big G M2 transconductance gain of this whole setup that includes a bunch of stuff in the formula, including this RTE2 down here. In a slide or two, I'll remind us as to what this big G M formula actually is. Now, if there was a voltage source down here, you would subtract VTE2 from this, but we don't, so we don't. All right, so what's VTB2? Well, that's the Thevenin equivalent voltage seen 
looking out of the base. So when I'm computing a Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base of Q2, I imagine cutting the wire here so no current's flowing. So the only current that is flowing to induce a voltage at RC1 is IC1. So I can relate that Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base to the short circuit current associated with the Norton equivalent circuit seen looking down into the collector here by multiplying by RC1 in parallel with RIC1, which is the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector of Q1. Again, there's a minus sign here because the arrow shows that we're pulling current out of the node. Okay, what's IC1? Well, that we can get from the Thevenin equivalent voltage seen looking out of the base of Q1, multiplying it by big GM1. And then what's the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base? Well, I can get that from my original voltage source out here by using a voltage divider rule, as we have in previous lectures. So when I'm computing a Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base here, I imagine cutting the wire here, so I just get a voltage divider where I have these resistors in parallel. So our big GM factors and our little r IC resistances, those depend on certain quantities, namely the resistance seen looking out of the bases. So the Thevenin resistance seen looking out of the base of Q1, well, to compute that, we need to zero out this voltage source, and I just see these three resistors in parallel. This is something we already saw in the lectures on the common emitter and common collector configurations. And I also need RTB2, the resistance seen looking out of the base here. Well, that will be a parallel combination of RC1 with the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector. Now, depending on which versions of these formulas we're going to use, you might also need to know the equivalent resistance seen looking up into the emitter, and that can be expressed in terms of RTB. And notice here, I basically have two formulas where the only difference between them is I either have a one or a two. So the version here uses RPI raw input resistances, and the version here uses emitter resistances. Okay, given all of those quantities, let's review what the big G and little r IC quantities are. For big G, I have five different expressions to choose from. For little r IC, I have two different expressions to choose from, and they are big and they are messy, but everything here is just plug and chug. Granted, there's a lot of plug and there's a whole lot of chug, but it is just plug and chug. So I've given these in a fairly generic form. You can imagine sticking a one in front of all of the various quantities here, or sticking a two in front of everything as needed to get the different versions for the different transistors. So to compute the voltage gain, we can just multiply all of these factors together. And notice here, I've combined the minus signs so that they cancel. And this makes a lot of sense. You have two inverting stages, so the inversions cancel. Okay, so what about the output resistance of this cascade? We're going to compute the resistance seen looking into this junction of RC2 and the collector of Q2. Notice that we're not including RL in this computation that's considered external to the amplifier. All right, so the output impedance is just RC2 in parallel with RIC1, the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector. But then you have to ask, well, what is IC2? So there's two different formulas for it. I'm giving one of them here. You can use the other formula if you want. That was on a previous slide. But to compute this, we need to know what RTB2 and RTE2 are. Well, RTE2, that was just this parallel combination of resistors seen looking out of the emitter here. And if you use some sort of alternate resistor configuration, you can modify this accordingly. All right, and then RTB, well, that's the resistance seen looking out of the base here. So that's going to be RC1 in parallel with RIC1, which is the Norton resistance seen looking into the collector of Q1. And then 
what is RIC1? Well, that's a similar kind of formula, but now we need the equivalent circuit seen looking out of Q1. And again, if you want, you don't have to use this version of the formula, you can use the other version. So RT1, that's just the combination of resistors down here. And RTB1, we computed on the previous slide, that's this Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base of Q1. So that is a lot of numbers to compute, but all you're doing is you're taking parallel combinations, which is just multiplying and adding and dividing, and you're doing other things like adding and multiplying and dividing. There's no fancy calculus or differential equations going on here. So what about the input impedance? So that's the resistance seen looking into this junction of R1, R2, and the base of Q1. So that's going to be R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with the resistance seen looking into the base of Q1. Notice that RS is not included in this impedance calculation. It's considered part of the source driving the amplifier and not part of the amplifier itself. All right, so what's RIB2? So that's just the raw input resistance of Q1, that's R pi 1, plus 1 plus beta times this emitter resistance down here, RTE1. Fortunately, none of the stuff up here shows up in the calculation of the input resistance. So that contrast with our output resistance, because notice the source of what's feeding this amplifier cascade shows up in the output resistance. That's the sort of detail that I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate. But here, whatever the load is, or for that matter, what else is happening up here, isn't reflected in the input impedance. One thing to note is that this is another justification for having some emitter resistance down here besides stabilizing the gain. So having this emitter resistance, that's referred to as emitter degeneration, and it does lower the gain, but it helps stabilize the gain. And having a resistance down here in the bias circuit helps stabilize the bias. But the main thing I wanna point out is that having some emitter resistance here in the small signal circuit actually improves your input impedance. Remember for a voltage input, you want that input impedance to be high. And if you don't have any emitter resistance here, well then you're just stuck with whatever the raw input resistance of the transistor is. But here, not only do you have that resistance at the emitter, but it's amplified by this one plus beta factor. So that's pretty awesome. Now you can easily imagine some special cases. For instance, if you can approximate the RO of Q2 as being infinite when computing this particular quantity here, it's also infinite. So this is infinite and the output impedance of the entire cascade is just this collector resistance RC2. And if we look at this gain expression, well, if we can assume that the r naughts are infinite, this goes away and this here goes away. And let's also assume that the load resistance is infinite. So this goes away. Let's also assume maybe that RS is zero. So this term winds up going to one. And then I just have this big GM1 times RC1 and this big GM2 times RC2. So if we were to focus just on these terms for a bit, then we can look at the same kind of special cases that we did in the common emitter lecture.